Well, we certainly are blessed, aren't we, to have the privilege to open God's Word together, brothers and sisters in Christ. I apologize if I sound like I'm coming out of a tunnel, I've got a bit of a cold, uh, but that's very minor and I'm sure I'll be okay in a few days. But again, it's good to be with you. My name is Craig Bratcher. I'm the pastor at Dawson Baptist Church in Philpott, Kentucky. And what a privilege it is, as I said, to be able to open up God's Word together. We are starting our Sunday school back. Uh, this is April 25th, and uh, we're getting our Sunday school going today. So there's a place for everybody uh, now, and uh, it's time for us to get back to getting things back to normal. We're having a revival. We're participating in a revival at Macedonia, our sister church just down the road, Macedonia Baptist Church, tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, everybody's welcome to attend that. Uh, Todd Gray, who works for uh, Kentucky Baptist Convention, is going to be speaking there tonight. And so I would ask that you be in prayer uh, for that event. This morning here, uh, our goal is to be encouraged and strengthened, as always, by the word of the living God. So Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, through chapter 9, verse 8, is our text for today. Now, in a moment, we'll be looking at those verses, but let me ask you as we begin, have you ever thought about how impressed we are with power, the rev of an engine, the crack of a bat? the roar of a lion, or the clap of thunder. I mean, events like these have the ability, don't they, to capture our attention, to fill us with wonder, and even to paralyze us with fear. Who... Um, can stand at a place like Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon or the pyramids of Egypt and not be overwhelmed by the sight. So there, there, there's a power in certain places that can rival the, the power that we hear in a motor or in, in a bat or a lion or a clap of thunder, something like those things. Again, there, there are certain moments in life that have great power, power to impress themselves indelibly upon our memories. The birth of a baby is one of those. The death of a parent, perhaps. Or a wedding day. In some ways, all of these things are powerful. But I would argue that nothing in this world has the potential to wield more power than our words. Consider the words of an Adolf Hitler is over against the words of a Martin Luther King Jr. Or consider the impact the words of a godly father as over against the words of an alcoholic father? Or what about the influence of a good teacher as opposed to uh, the words of a classmate who is a bully? Power is so much more than just how much weight we can lift or how many followers we might have on Twitter. The most powerful people on earth are most certainly those who have the authority to influence how we think and how we behave. Now, often those voices that wield that kind of influence, they don't deserve to have that kind of influence. They, they don't need to be listened to and heeded the way they often are because they're often just pumping out lies and error 
and uh, they're leading people astray, and they're bringing harm, and they're, and they're dividing people. But there is one whose voice does deserve to be heard above all other voices, because he has supreme power and supreme authority. Many inferior voices today are, are working feverishly to try to silence his voice, but they're not going to succeed even if it does sometimes feel like they will. They've been trying to silence his voice from the very beginning of time. They've tried to overthrow his authority thousands of thousands of times, and they've always failed, and they're going to continue to fail. Because it is impossible to defeat the one who has matchless power, the one whose power is limitless. Of course, I'm referring to the Lord. In the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to be looking today at three events in the life of the Lord Jesus that demonstrate his power and authority. Now, Matthew does not share these events because he's just trying to take up space, make his gospel larger. Um, he shares them instead so that we will be compelled by these uh, truths to be utterly overwhelmed by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the end result will be then that we give glory to God for giving Jesus the authority that he has. So let's just dive in here. The first of these three events occurs on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had just given the order, back up in chapter 8, verse 18, to go to the other side of the sea. And he explained, right before they left, to two would-be followers what it really takes to be one of his followers. And so now the time has come for him to depart. And so in verses 23 through 27, we see revealed here that following Jesus might just lead to some scary moments in our lives. But we're going to get through it because Jesus is with us. That's important to see here. Look at what it says. As he got into the boat, <clears throat> this is Matthew 8, verse 23 through verse 27. His disciples followed him. Suddenly, a violent storm arose on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but Jesus kept sleeping. So the disciples came and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to die. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. Now, it's hard to believe, isn't it, that Jesus could sleep at a time like this. Here he was in this small boat, about 26 feet by 7 feet, you know, about 26 feet long, about 7 feet wide. Not really a, a huge vessel by any means, is it? I mean, hardly something that wouldn't get tossed around a whole lot in the midst of a violent storm at sea. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, the text actually says it's being swamped by the waves. And here's Jesus fast asleep. Well, this certainly shows his humanity, doesn't it? I mean, here, he, he, he's just, you know, he's asleep. But more than that, more than the fact that it shows his humanity uh, and the fact that he can sleep, it, it shows his humanity in the sense that he's just utterly exhausted. Because it just takes a lot out of you to minister the way Jesus 
went about ministering. I mean, Jesus was just, you know, constantly being bombarded with people who were coming to him needing his assistance. And, and he just, you know, he, he was just on the move all the time and always helping people. And so he, he, he just didn't get enough rest. We've all heard about the, the stress that a number of our doctors and nurses in our nation have been under uh, over this past year during this COVID crisis. You see, when you give and you give and you give, you, you just reach a point where you just become so utterly spent that you can sleep anywhere and under almost any circumstance. And that, that's where Jesus is in this passage. I mean, he's, just, he's utterly spent. And so he's got an opportunity to sleep, and he's taking advantage of it, and he's so tired that he's sleeping even though the winds are howling and the water's crashing all over him. And apparently it was no ordinary storm. I mean, this thing is, is something that, that has men who were expert fishermen scared to death. I mean, these guys have been out there before. I mean, this, this is a common thing on the Sea of Galilee. It happens all the time, even to this day. I mean, the wind can just rush down from the nearby uh, <clears throat> mountains, and it can just swoop down upon the sea, and it can be as calm as can be one minute, and then it's just this raging tempest the next, because that's the way it works there. And that's what happened in this situation. And they'd been there before, but never had, apparently, they faced a storm like this. It was so bad that they feared they were going to die. And so, after they tried everything else, they decided they better wake Jesus up and plead with him to save them. Otherwise, they feared they would die. So they think, man, this, this, this one's just too much, you know. We, we've never seen one like this before. It's more than we can handle, and we, we, need, we need help. And the only thing they knew to do was to call upon their leader, the Lord Jesus, and see what he might do. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in moments like that in life, don't we? Moments we find ourselves just completely overwhelmed, we're overcome, we're, we're dominated, you know, everything seems hopeless. You're in a marriage and you're trying everything you can to make it work and it's not working. Man, that could be just the most overwhelming experience you can almost possibly imagine. Or if you have a loved one or maybe you yourself suddenly come down with some kind of a sickness and, and, uh, you know, you've tried everything, you've gone to see all the doctors, and nobody seems to have any answers. That can be such a scary and overwhelming experience in your life. Or maybe there's a loved one in your family, maybe it's a child, and, 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 and he or she gets on drugs, and it just it, 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 it overwhelms you. You don't know what to do. You don't know how you're going to cope. You don't know how you're going to get through this. In times like these, we fear. The fear begins to grip us and overwhelm us. And so we cry out like the disciples, Lord, save us. And Jesus probably would say the same thing to us as he said to them, Oh, you of little faith. You have only a little faith. Why are you so afraid? You see, the implication is, don't you know who I am? Of course, they didn't really fully understand who he is, and I, think, I guess sometimes we don't really fully understand who Jesus is, do we? All we say we do, we think we do, you know, we think we've got our theology straightened out. But when we get into the midst of these experiences, we act like we don't have any faith. And we need to be reminded of who we're talking to. Jesus reminds us in this text who it is that we talk to. Maybe if you're going through one of these hard times, you need to remember who it is that you're talking to. And I love what Jesus does. He gets up. He gets up. And he rebukes the wind. He stands up in the boat. And he begins to speak 
to the wind and to the sea. What an amazing thing. Like he has authority over both the wind and the sea. And guess what? He rebukes them, and immediately there's calm. The wind stops blowing. The waves stop crashing. And it's just silent, and it's calm. Just try to put yourself in the boat in that moment. Are you there? Who could possibly do this? It's the question, right? No wonder they're amazed and they're asked, asking, what kind of man is this? That's it. That's the question that we need to ask. You know what's amazing? Think about this. Jesus doesn't pray here. Now, Jesus prays many other times in the Bible. Jesus doesn't pray here. No, he gets up not depending upon the Father, but taking it upon himself to rebuke the winds and the seas. In other words, what is Jesus doing? What does Matthew want us to see here? Clearly, he wants us to see that Jesus is divine. Right? Isn't that what he wants us to see? Of course it is. I want you to listen to three passages out of the Psalms. Now, you remember the Psalms were written before Jesus came along, and so these are references to the Lord God the Father. But it sounds just like what we're reading here. Listen to this. Psalm 65, verse 7. You silence the roar of the seas, the roar of the waves, and the tumult of the nations. Psalm 89, verse 9. You rule the raging sea. When its waves surge, you still them. And Psalm 107, verse 29. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Since Jesus did exactly the same things, it can only mean that he is God. What an amazing thing that Matthew is pointing out for us here. Now, I'm not sure, I don't think, that the disciples grasp this fully. But clearly this is what Matthew is wanting you and me, the readers of this text, to begin to see. He wants us to conclude that Jesus is God. He has to be because he controls the weather, and only God can do that. Now, the second event in this passage happens when they reach the other side of the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> they go to, into the region that's called the Gadarenes, or uh, some think it's the Gergesenes. The, those are two places that were really fairly close together over in that region on the other side of the sea. And so it's not really a problem either way. There they encounter two men, and each one of these men has a demon or demons. Now, interestingly, you know, many people in the modern world would deny that such a thing is possible. They, they don't even think that Demons actually exist. Say that this is part of superstition uh, of the ancient world and it has no place, no bearing in our time. Of course, many people in other parts of the world, they don't have any problem with that. <clears throat> they understand that demons are real. The Bible certainly teaches that they are. Here's what it says. Verse 28, when he came to the other side, to the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him as they came out of the tombs. 
and they were so violent that no one could pass that way. <clears throat> Suddenly they shouted, What do you have to do with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? A long way off from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. If you drive us out, <clears throat> the demons begged him, send us into the herd of pigs. Go, he told them. And when they'd come out, they entered the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, perished in the water. Then the men who tended them fled. They went into the city and reported everything, especially what had happened to those who were demon-possessed. With that, the whole town went out to meet Jesus. When they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. So once again, Matthew wants us to see the authority of Jesus on display, and certainly it is here, isn't it? Now, it's interesting as we look at these demons here that these demons are afraid that Jesus might, as they put it, torment them before the time. <laughs> um, you see, they know that Jesus has authority over them. And he has authority to place them in hell. That's what they're fearful of. And they're thinking, well, he might do that before the allotted time. They knew that the allotted time was at the end when they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire at the end of uh, the world as we know it. But they plead that Jesus not do that, but that he instead that he send them into that herd of pigs that wasn't all that far down the road. They, they said they'd rather live in the unclean pigs than in hell, and I'm sure that they would. Now, Jesus permits them to do this. I think that the reason that he did that is not because he didn't value pigs. Now, some people say, well, well, this, this just shows that Jesus doesn't value animals. I mean, there'd be people that'd be very upset about this in our culture today. They're not too upset about us aborting children, but they're certainly upset if we hurt animals. Well, animals, according to the Bible, are not made in the image of God, but babies are. Where's the concern for the babies? Nevertheless, this happened today. I feel convinced that many people would be terribly upset about this cruelty to animals. Of course, Jesus isn't trying to be cruel to the animals here. He is trying to be gracious to these men who've been harassed by these demons, and, and they see the demons go into those animals and, and they rush headlong to their destruction because the demons had left them to enter into these animals. Now they realize for sure the demons have actually left. Now, there's a sad part in this story here. The people of the town beg Jesus to leave. They want him to completely depart from their region. Why would they do that? Because Jesus had just helped these men who were so violent that nobody could even pass by them. Well, probably part of the answer to this is uh, they were concerned about their profit margin. And Jesus had killed off several pigs, and maybe he would, if he stayed around, he would take more livestock or do other damage like this. Maybe they feared him in that sense. And they were more concerned about their profit than they were about lives or their own soul. And I suspect that there's something else going on here, and that is that they sense that there is, there is something unique about Jesus. There is a holiness about him. There's something about human sinfulness that has an aversion to being around holiness. Many people prefer their sin, and they would feel extremely uncomfortable around anyone or anything that reminds them of their sin. I think that that is a description of our society today. We're living in a society today that is growing increasingly uncomfortable with what is holy. 
And he's therefore pushing it farther, farther, farther away. But here's the thing that we've got to understand, friends. People can do that for a season, but not forever. Because there's coming a day when Jesus Christ cannot be pushed aside. There's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In fact, he's already won the victory. When he died and rose again, he won the decisive victory. And it's just a matter of time until he wraps it all up. There is one other thing here in this passage, and we're going to look at it in chapter 9, verses 1 to 8. We looked at two events. We've seen the authority of Jesus over nature, and we've seen his authority over demons. But there's one other authority that Jesus shows here, and in many ways it maybe is the most important of all. We know that he's God. We know that the demons are no match for him. What about our sin? What can Jesus do about our sin? See, that's our greatest problem, isn't it? Our greatest problem that we'll ever face in our lives is our own sin. What's Jesus going to do about that? Well, let's find out. So chapter 9, verses 1 to 8. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. And just then... Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a stretcher. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Have courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the scribes said to themselves, He's blaspheming. Perceiving their thoughts, Jesus said, Well, why are you thinking evil things in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he told the paralytic, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. So he got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and gave glory to God who had given such authority to men. The friends of the paralytic, and, and no doubt the paralytic himself, we're hoping for a physical healing of this man's paralysis. Because you see, to be paralyzed is to be confined. It's to be restricted. It is to be imprisoned in your own body. And those of us who don't have that experience, those of us who can walk, we don't, we don't really have any idea what those limitations that come from paralysis are really like. I mean, what a frustration it must be to have to live every day dependent on others for virtually everything. If you're going to eat, somebody's going to have to feed you. If you're going to drink, somebody's going to have to give you a drink. If you're going to get a bath, somebody's going to have to bathe you. If you're going to move around, somebody's going to have to move you around. If you're going to go to the bathroom, somebody's going to have to help you. I mean, it's hard to think of anything more humiliating. So what a joy Jesus brings to this man and, and to his caregivers also when he chooses to restore this man's ability to walk as he does in this passage. It's beautiful. But that's not the most important thing that Jesus does for this man because he also, as we see there in the text that we read, he forgives the man his sins. Now, remember the scribes? Scribes were upset about this. They weren't happy. They think that Jesus is blaspheming. They know only God has authority to forgive sins, and they don't think that Jesus is God, and so they think that he's committing a terrible sin here. And Jesus is like, well, how am I going to show them that I have the ability to forgive sins? Well, I'm going to show it by healing this man. <coughs> And that's what he does. Now, the deepest need, as I said a moment ago, that we have in this world is the need to be forgiven. And that trumps everything. I'll give you an example. Johnny Erickson Tata, some of you have heard of her. 
She was paralyzed from the neck down when she was a teenager. She had a diving accident. Ever since then, she's been paralyzed, but she nevertheless has lived a very full life. She paints with her mouth. She composes music. She writes books. She speaks at conferences. She hosts a radio program. She has a beautiful testimony in an international ministry. She knows that when she gets to heaven, that she's going to be made whole. She's eagerly awaiting that day. Like, I hope you are. For now, she's trusting in the Lord to sustain her. She said that she would rather, this is the amazing thing, she said she would rather be in a wheelchair and be forgiven than to be whole and unforgiven. You see, she understands the most important thing in life is to have her sins forgiven. Jesus must have known that this paralytic in his own hometown uh, felt the same way. Nevertheless, Jesus healed him too in order to show others his incredible authority to forgive sins. And when the people saw this, they were awestruck and they gave God glory. As we've seen today, God certainly deserves, doesn't he, to be glorified, praised, and honored. Because he he can do whatever he wants. He can control the weather. He can drive out demons. He can forgive sins. Friend, we face challenges in our lives every day. Certainly some days far more than others. Some of those challenges are natural. Some of them are spiritual. These three events that we've looked at today, they show that Jesus is our means of overcoming these challenges. It is to him, then, that we must look. It is in him that we must trust. He is our hope. He is our life. He is our everything. So may we live to give him honor, praise, glory. May we live for them and not for our own praise and honor and glory. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. What awesome authority you've entrusted to him. Same authority that you have because he is your divine son. May we love him. May we trust him and live for him. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.